Welcome to another episode of The Ninja Nagora. Uh, today we are fortunate to have uh, Professor David Crystal, who's one of the world's most eminent linguists, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure having him along. Uh, hello, David. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, guys. Uh, anytime. Um, I guess the, the, you've probably been asked this a million times, but I would ask you a million and first. Where did your interest in language start? Oh, well, that's an easy one to answer, or at least it is now. Um, it started here. I'm speaking to you from my home in North Wales, in Holyhead. It's a bilingual area. Uh, when I was growing up, it was actually a trilingual area because there was Welsh as well as English, and Irish was quite spoken in Holyhead too. And I remember my mum told me, uh, so I don't really remember, but I remember her telling me that when I was about three, I was extremely curious about the language situation because we were in a monolingual household mm. outside were these languages. And I remember asking her, I still, still think I remember it. You know, why do I understand that person? But I don't understand that person. What's going on? And she introduced me to the language names, you see, which is something that kids don't usually pick up until they're about three, three and a half or something like that. She said, that's called English and that's called Welsh. Oh, why don't I speak Welsh? Ah, well, go and see Uncle Joe. So she sent me to see Uncle Joe, you see, and he was a Welsh speaker and he taught me some Welsh. And indeed, we started to chat in Welsh a little bit because at that age, you pick up languages easily, don't you? And so I think anybody that's, that grows up in a multilingual environment where there are issues of that kind, uncertainties about who's talking and why and when and where, you develop a curiosity about language. And I reckon it started there. And then it was fueled soon after by other language experiences. So I was brought up in a Roman Catholic household and by the age of six, I was serving mass. And so I learned Latin. Not very intelligibly, but I nonetheless started to learn it. And that was a curiosity as well, you see. What's this strange language doing? Why is it there? And then secondary school brought me in touch with French and more Latin and Greek. And English as a language was part of the study there. And that fueled me to go to university where I read English language and literature and learned more languages like Gothic and Old Norse and things like this. And ended up with a career in linguistics, you see, which is the science of language and where it's the ultimate for anybody with an interest in language, you have to end up doing linguistics. So that's the story. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, oh, it's in Shadow come back. Well, a door, of course, Juan. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, that's a first. I haven't been asked that in a podcast before. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Um, if, if we look at, obviously, you, you've studied language for, for, for a long time. How do trends start? And, and maybe how, how do they differ today from, say, for example, 60s or 70s? Oh, well, the history of linguistics is about a it's not that old, really, is it? it? It all starts back in the 19th century with the historical study of language. It used to be called philology, didn't it? Which is largely the study of written texts, um, literary texts, very largely, and so on. And in the early 20th century, it develops a spoken dimension, people getting very interested in speech and realizing that there are far more languages in the world than just the Indo-European ones that were being studied in philology, you know, there are actually languages in places like Africa and so on, you know, these are really worth studying. And so during the early decades of the 20th century, you get that kind of broadening of the subject. And it began with a, a focus on sounds, on the individual sounds of a language. End of the 18th century was the period when phonetics developed as a subject, you know, the International Phonetic Alphabet was introduced in the 1880s, that sort of thing. Subjects like speech therapy began, you know, speech therapy, you see. And then uh, in the 20th century, we see a broadening from, a broadening of the focus from not just sounds now, sounds appear in words. So let's study the structure of words and you get the development of the subject of morphology, which is the study of word structure. And we're in the 1930s now. And then a couple of decades later, words appear in sentences. So you get the development of the study of sentence structure, syntax, 
we're in the 1950s and 60s now, Noam Chomsky comes along, you see, and people like him focusing on syntax. And then people realized that there was more to sentences than just their structure. They actually had a meaning as well. So you get the subject of semantics developing as a branch of, the, of, of linguistics. And that, we know in the 1970s, first big books on semant semantics written then. But up until then, you notice that the focus has been on the structure of language, on the forms of language. And the big shift took place in the 1970s, really, when people switched from the study of structure to the study of use. Yeah. Let's look at the way these sentences are being used. Let's look at the context. Let's look at the social context, the psychological context, and all of this. So you then get the development of sociolinguistics as a subject and psycholinguistics as a subject. And then later, the most wonderful development of all, for me, I think the most important development in linguistics in recent decades, the development of the subject of pragmatics. Now, what is pragmatics? My definition is pragmatics is the study of the choices you make when you use language, the reasons for those choices and the effects that the choices convey. So in other words, it's answering the question, why? Why do we use language in a particular way? What were the reasons for speaking in that particular way or writing in that particular way? What was the effect that you hoped that choice of speech or writing would have on your listeners and readers. And so the big shift has been away from merely a study of structure, though I say merely, it's a complicated business in its own right, to the placing of language in the broadest possible context, the study of the people who use language. It's become a more human subject in many ways, and in English language teaching too, because once upon a time, in teaching, as you guys well know, and any most of the people watching this will be very familiar with a teaching world where you just studied structure, structure, structure. And then suddenly language in use, the communicative approach, all of these things developed where you now looked at the realities of language in the world. And it made the subject, in my view, much more interesting, made learning much more enjoyable and intellectually um, presented us with a whole new range of opportunities for research which had never been conceived of before. Mm. I, I read something uh, a couple of years ago uh, about how language was, was, was dying, you know, that um, it, it, it was being slaughtered, uh, people misusing it, uh, mispronunciation, that kind of thing. Um, and when I looked at it, you know, it was one of these things from, from 1920. Uh, it, it resonated with me with today as well. And so um, I guess, that, do we worry too much? And um, if we do, why is it, why is it so important to, to some people and not to others that we get language right? Mm, it's curious, isn't it? It's, it? it's always been there. There are people who worry uh, about uh, prophets of doom about every subject under the sun. Um, the, the, the language worries are really relatively recent. Um, people didn't worry too much about that sort of thing in Shakespeare's time, for instance, but in the 18th century, it all shifted. There was a, when you talk about language worries and language developments of that kind, we're talking really about social history rather than linguistic history. Virtually all the problems that you mention have a social origin rather than a linguistic origin. And it all started in the 18th century. Uh, before that, we had a nice clear-cut situation. There was the upper class and there was the lower class. And everybody knew where they were. And then in the 18th century, along comes this new middle class or class, you see. Uh, the new industrialists, the people who invented everything, the roads, the locomotives, the textile machines. They come along, they're rich. They make a lot of money. They have big houses. They get invited to dinner at the house of the local aristocrat and they have a good time, but they go back home and there are diary accounts exactly like this. And they say, you know, they were laughing at us because of the way we spoke. You know, we don't speak like them. We better do something about that. And they do. They go to elocution classes. Mm -hmm. Elocution develops as a subject at the end of the 18th century. 
and they try to learn to speak like their, in inverted commas, betters. Mm. And at that point, you get a worry about pronunciation, about grammar, about vocabulary, which is enshrined in the books that were written at the end of the 18th century, chiefly Dr. Johnson's dictionary, in which he marks certain words as vulgar and, you know, not to be used. Uh, grammar books like Bishop Louth's and Lindley Murray's, which tell you that you, certain grammatical constructions are wrong. You must not use them. Educated, polite people don't use them, so you shouldn't. And the first books on pronunciation, the first uh, big dictionary of pronunciation by John Walker, published in 1791, a critical pronouncing dictionary, he calls it. And in the pre preface, he says quite clearly, you want to read my book. Otherwise, you will end up speaking like the horrible Scots and the <laughs> terrible Irish and especially the awful Cockneys in London. <laughs> he uses vocabulary like that. And it influenced generations, you see. These days we say, why should we follow the dictates of an individual like Johnson or Murray or Walker? Well, very different mindset in the 18th century. Oh, yes. You follow these people. These are the experts. These are the authorities. If we follow them, we will be safe, you see. Now, that attitude influenced everybody. It came to be taught in the schools. The schools trained the, uh, the civil servants, the, the politicians, the missionaries, all the people who formed the British Empire, you see. So these attitudes spread all over the world. And they lasted until the middle of the 20th century. I was taught by people who talk, told me, um, this is in the 1950s, uh, that this pronunciation is wrong. This grammatical structure is wrong. If you use it, you will get poor marks, Crystal, and I will beat you if you use it. I was, I was punished for splitting an infinitive, you know, to boldly go. Uh, no, that, 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 I have to hammer that out of you, Crystal. And not just me, when I did radio programs in the 1980s, English Now, my Radio 4 series, and we had a program on split infinitives, I mentioned my experience. I got dozens of letters from people who said, it was my experience as well. I suffered for my language. And people would say things like this. So there was this buildup of concern, of anxiety, uh, of people who felt now that if they don't maintain these traditional usage patterns of prescriptivism, uh, that they are indeed letting the language down. And it produces a generation, or several generations of people who, for the best, in their mind, they are doing the best for the language by trying to maintain these traditional views. Things are changing. Mm. Such people still exist, but they are a steadily decreasing minority to be frank you know they're dying off that old generation um which i am a part of and i'm still rather surprised that uh i didn't follow in the, their footsteps you know i'm a descriptive linguist i value all of these varieties i don't criticize uh, take the old rule you should never end a sentence with a preposition in other words, you should never say, this is the man I was speaking to. You should say, this is the man to whom I was speaking. Now, in the 18th century, uh, this was condemned. You see, the, the end sentence preposition was condemned. And I was taught, you know, that I should only use the former. As a linguist, I know very well that there are these two competing usages in English. There is the formal use of to whom. There is the informal use of to at the end. Both are valid in their appropriate circumstances. And you will find both in the history of English. Shakespeare, for example, puts prepositions in the middle and at the end, depending upon the circumstances. So this kind of descriptive approach is one that I very much value. And it's one that many people still, but as I say, in a decreasing number of cases, um, consider to be in just wrong. You know, you will get people saying, no, you should still never do this. You should never split an infinitive. You should never, you should never, you should never, and so on. I believe that the 
broader stylistic approach is much more valuable because it enables us to see um, how, first of all, language is a multiplicity of styles, is a multiplicity of effects. That there isn't one pure form of a language. There never has been in any language. And that this juxtaposition of styles is part of what makes a language rich and expressive and in literary terms so creative. There could never have been a Shakespeare if only one variety of language had existed. And so, yes, I still encounter the, these older attitudes. There is still a Queen's English Society where the members uh, insist on advocating a notion of purity of some sort, uh, even though they don't themselves agree very much on what that notion is. But nonetheless, they, they, they sincerely do want to try and maintain standards. And we all agree about that. We all want standards to be maintained. But at the same time, we have to recognize that the language has a huge amount of social variation, which is reflected in linguistic terms, and that mustn't be dismissed. It's terrible when children are brought up to think that the usage they have at home, that their parents use, that they have in the streets and so on, is wrong. Mm. Whereas, of course, they should simply be told, it's appropriate in its circumstances, but don't use it when you're applying for a job where you need standard English and so on. In other words, they need to balance the two. Standard English and non-standard should be seen as two sides as a coin, not as a good coin versus a bad coin. Yeah. And that, I think, is the change in attitude that I've seen in linguistics over the, as a result of linguistics over the past 50 years. Uh, but the old attitudes die hard, and they are still out there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about the use of technology and the globalization of English. So where do you see, what impact do you see that having on the usage of the English language? So you talked about mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the changes uh, in the past 50 years or so, but the use of technology has really pushed it to other dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, short forms and uh, the the line between formal and informal English is kind of blurred now for yeah, a yeah. yeah, You're right. But not it hasn't changed as much as people think, you know. Um, there have been, of course, immediate changes that came along as the medium was introduced and novelty was noticed by everybody. But when you actually look at the language that's on the internet now and in various social media forums and in texting and all the rest of it, yeah. the vast majority of it is exactly the same as it was before the internet arrived in the first place. Um, what happened was, quite simply, that uh, a new technology arrives, it allows new forms to be used, as in texting with the abbreviations and things like that, People notice the new forms and say, oh, gosh, this is a huge development. It's a disaster. Uh, the young children of today are introducing these newfangled expressions like C for you see and U for you and later with an eight in the middle. It, they don't know how to spell. They're leaving letters out that, that using words like message, spelling it M-S-G. Obviously, they don't know how to spell. It's a disaster. Prophets of Doom, once again. This is the early 2000s we're talking about now. I remember the, uh, uh, the television and radio pundit John Humphreys uh, writing a, a, an article in the Daily Mail, I think it was, saying that the text messages of today are like the Goths and Vandals of ancient Europe, raping and pillaging the English language. <laughs> you know, going on like this. It was a huge exaggeration. Yeah. The number of abbreviations that were being introduced at the time was minimal. Research studies now have shown that only about 10% of the words in text messages then were abbreviated. And these days it's a lot less. Moreover, most of the abbreviations were not novel. They had been in the language for generations. Abbreviations like C for C and U for U, we find 100 years ago, 200 years ago in English. Lewis Carroll in Alice in Wonderland and places like that uses them. And they don't know how to spell. Well, 
if it's cool to leave letters out because it's cool, then you've got to know that the letters are there in the first place in order to leave them out. Mm. Otherwise, it's not cool. <laughs> and the research showed that the best text messengers are the best spellers, in fact. They're very good at it. Anyway, this is all history now, because text messaging abbreviations have become unfashionable mm. amongst youngsters. I was in a school not so long ago. One of the things I do when I go into schools is I ask, uh, this is at sixth form level, um, I ask the kids to collect some text messages or some other online usage, and we analyze it and see what's going on. And I was presented with a set of text messages, and there wasn't a single abbreviation to be seen. <laughs> so I said to the kids, where have they gone? And they looked at me as if I was from a different planet, and they said, you know, they're not cool. <laughs> But we, we used to do that when we were young, said these 16-year-olds. <laughs> and indeed, uh, further down the school, they were still using them, but not at 16 and 17. Sorry, they're naff. They're, they're all, you know. And one lad clinched it for me. He said to me, I'll tell you when I stopped abbreviating. I stopped when my dad started. <laughs> Did you get it? I mean, when older people... Yeah. Start using young people's slang. It's no longer cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so to get back to the general question, many, many of the points that are considered to be really novel and, and so on, they have a transience. That, that they're not permanent features of the language. Some abbreviations will stay. Undoubtedly, a few will. LOL will. L-O-L. Laughing out loud. That's now in the dictionary. And, and it's a useful little expression. So there will be a few things like that. But when you look at all the areas of development and you look at the number of new words that have come into English as a result of the internet, yeah. we're talking about a few thousand only. You think that's a lot? No, it isn't. It's over a million words in English. A few thousand new ones is neither here nor there. New grammar. I can't think of a single new grammatical construction that has come into English as a result of the internet. New orthography, ah yes, here there are some novelties indeed. Uh, by orthography I mean spelling, capitalization and punctuation. Well yes, when you look at uh, new styles of online expression like emails and blogs and forums and Twitter and all that, then you do see some new punctuation styles, punctuation-less yeah. messages, for instance, exaggerated punctuation, fantastic, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, you know, that sort of thing. So this all adds to the expressive richness of English. It hasn't replaced anything. Traditional English punctuation still exists alongside the new sorts of punctuation we see online. So the language hasn't changed in any dramatic way, but it has grown, adding, as I say, to expressive richness. And I see this as a good thing. Of course, once again, the students have to be taught appropriateness. It would be most inappropriate to use some of these new styles in formal context. And this does happen. I, I was talking to uh, a businessman not so long ago about this very subject, and he showed me. Um, a letter of application that had been sent in for a job asking for an interview online, which ended with a smiley yeah. and, <laughs> and, a, and a completely inappropriate informal register of expression with abbreviations all over the place. He said, I didn't give him an interview. I don't want people who, who don't know the difference between formal and informal writing like that. So obviously there's an important teaching job that has to be done here, but in the broader context, um, I don't actually see perhaps just 1% of the language has been affected by these technological changes. An important 1%, yeah. but, but still only 1%. Yeah. How, so how, you mentioned the, the lol and, and ending there with a, with a smiley. How do you feel about the emoji being in the dictionary? Well, emojis, once again, have had a, an exaggerated press. Um, th there aren't that many of them. Um, 
And here too, we saw a peak of popularity and we're beginning to see a decline. Um, for many people, they're no longer cool. And you see this in the organization that um, introduces them, the uh, Unicode system, where at intervals, uh, a new set of emojis are given a public blessing, as it were, uh, by the organization. And the last set that I looked at a few months ago now, uh, there weren't as many new emojis being introduced as there had been the previous year and likewise the previous year and so on. And the ones that were being introduced were not there to introduce new concepts. They were there to tweak old concepts, by which I mean so many of the emoji faces were, uh, you know, white middle class males, you know. And so the new emojis now have different skin color. Uh, they have different gender characteristics and so on. Um, different clothing characteristics, things like that. And so there is a kind of social identity development there rather than uh, a cognitive uh, development. Well, all of this is simply to make the medium um, appropriate and inoffensive and valuable to the diverse people who uh, might want to use them. But even so, we're talking about a tiny fraction of communicative strategy here. Um, I, I don't have any statistics on this one. Uh, perhaps it's too early to say. But my impression is that emojis are rarely used by comparison with everything else. I know some people use them a lot. If you go to Twitter, for instance, I got a tweet message the other day about podcasts which had... 30 emojis at the end of it. Clap, 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 clap. Sure, your podcast will get that kind of reaction from visitors. I hope it will. Uh, but, you know, so people do do that sort of thing. But on the whole, they don't use them very much. And certainly, um, they have learned the limitations of emoticons and emojis in recent years. You know, there was a thought once upon a time that these things were going to solve the problem of ambiguity in internet communication. That's how, it, that's how it all started with the original smileys with punctuation marks and things like that. The thought was that if I put a, uh, a smile at the end of a sentence, it will show my readers uh, that I mean it as a joke, you see, in case they interpreted it as something serious. But then they realized, and it took a while, but now people realize that just to add a smile at the end of a message doesn't necessarily disambiguate the message. What does a smile mean? It can mean humor. It can mean sarcasm. It can even be a threat. <laughs> you remember? Come in, Mr. Bond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely smile. Is he being funny? Is he being happy? No, he isn't. These smiles can mean anything you want them to mean. And this is the sort of thing um, that people have gradually realized, that emojis and emoticons don't solve all problems of ambiguity. They're a useful extra resource. Once again, the language's expressive richness has increased, but they're not a dramatic change in communicative opportunity. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to uh, ask ask your opinion of, or, or what you think about when I'm, I'm talking about specifically the written word here, not not spoken. Um, I could say, for example, if, if if I say something about Shakespeare and I get it wrong, and someone says, "No, no, no, it was um, it was a fellow that said that," or it was Yoga that said that. Oh, that, okay, that's fine. I'll accept the mistake. Or if I say uh, if I spell a name incorrectly or mispronounce a name. And someone said, for example, my name, they call me Pacino, Pacino, and I say, oh, it's Pacino. And they say, oh, sorry, Mr. Pacino. Yet when you correct someone's grammar, or if, you know, for example, uh, a should of instead of a should have, or a should have, um, they get really annoyed about it. Why is that, do you think? Well, what's the intention behind the correction? That, that's the thing. This is where pragmatics comes into play, you see. The intention is one thing. The effect is another. Ideally, the intention and the effect should be commensurate. And so 
if, an, if the correction has been made in an appropriate way at an appropriate time in an appropriate tone of voice, etc., 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 then you shouldn't get that kind of um, reaction. If you do, something has gone wrong. And the analysis of the situation should try to make it clear what has gone wrong. Um, one can't really say much more than that without knowing the individual circumstances that, that motivated it. But this is an issue. Yeah. He's talking about mostly online communication where people uh, term him as grammar Nazi when he, <laughs> <laughs> so when he tends to correct them. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the question is again, why, you see, why is the correction taking place? Mm -hmm. It would be inappropriate uh, to, to use a blanket negative here and say you should never, mm -hmm. never say should have mm -hmm. or write should of. Mm -hmm. And you think never? No, if you want to represent in a novel uh, somebody's uh, non-standard usage, then you would use should of as one of the immediate signals that the person is speaking in a non-standard way. You'll even find it in some literature. Keats, for example, has writing in his letters where he spells should of with an O-F. In other words, this kind of thing is a very natural reflection of people who want to write down spoken language as close as possible to the way in which it is spoken. Mm. Now, the circumstances in which you do that are pretty limited, but they are nonetheless important. Mm. So it's once again this question of uh, style, isn't it really, of circumstance, of appropriateness to an audience, to a, to a readership. Mm. Um, if you put your correction, O oh Nazi, um, <laughs> into, uh, a, in, into a context and you say, in formal writing, in the following circumstances, it would be inappropriate because you will be criticized. It's not just me that is criticizing you. I'm actually trying to help you by pointing out that if you do this in these circumstances, you will be criticized. Here's me helping you. It's not what Nazis do at all. I'm helping. I'm caring. It's the caring profession that uh, I, I'm representing here. And in these circumstances, I'm just telling you that if you use that kind of construction and you, in a letter applying for a job, you probably will not get the job because in society, these distinctions exist. So replacing the, um, the, the, the metaphors of criminality by metaphors of caring you would actually defuse, I think, a lot of the criticisms that might be directed at you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a doctor or a nurse, <laughs> not a policeman. Not a policeman. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I have a question about teaching writing to non-native speakers. So uh, with the change in linguistics and language teaching with Krashen and the emphasis going away from grammar to communicative language with Halliday and Krashen over the years, uh, it's not so much the grammar or um, uh, say the technicalities or the conventions of the language. It's more about that they're not able to construct logical arguments or th think critically uh, when they write. So how, do you have any advice on how we can, as teachers, overcome that? Well, I, I, looking back at the history of ideas in the subject now, um, as, a, as an outsider, remember, I'm not a teacher. I, I've never done the difficult job of being in a class and actually trying to teach the language kids and teenagers. Heaven help me, teenagers. Oh, <laughs> ha, gosh. Uh, I, I've taught uh, in teaching in service in, in summer schools and things like that to teachers, but I've not done the really difficult job. But looking at it, looking back at it, there's been a pendulum swing, hasn't there? From a time when only structure was taught to a time when structure was almost dismissed and lost sight of, and you get the approach where use was the only thing. One has to bring these two things together. They are two sides of a coin. I can't imagine myself wanting to teach structure without teaching use. And conversely, I can't imagine wanting to teach use without teaching structure. Mm. Without two things coming together, um, then all kinds of problems arise, it seems to me. This has happened in mother tongue teaching as well as foreign language teaching, you see. 
exactly the same history took place in the British and other countries' classrooms in the teaching of English. So you get a situation where at one time, um, in my years, uh, only structure was taught. And then you get a period of something like 20 or 30 years where no grammar was taught in classes at all. And so you get people ending up uh, not knowing what a preposition was and not knowing what tenses are and things like this. And the problem was immense because people are no longer able to talk about how an effect is achieved. Uh, you would take a, an example of a, a literary author and you say, I love his writing. Why do you love his writing? What is it about his writing? I'd love to write like him. Mm. I've actually got a, an example of this. Um, I was uh, at a literary festival in, in Stratford and I'd given my talk and came outside to the cafe area and there was a teacher with a group of um, youngsters, uh, nine, ten year olds. And she said, oh, look, uh, here's Mr. Grammar. She said, <laughs> I've just been talking about grammar, you see. She said, come, come and talk to my, my class. So I thought, oh, Lord, uh, what's going to happen now? Uh, so I sat down and she said, tell them about grammar. Uh, what? So I said, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I said to the kids, you know, what are you reading? And this uh, little poppy uh, said to me, I'm, I'm reading Terry Pratchett. I said, which Terry Pratchett are you reading? And she showed me, it was the carpet people. I said, oh, isn't that lovely? I like Terry Pratchett as well. Oh, do you? Yes, I do. Why, why, why do you like Terry Pratchett? Oh, I want to write like Terry Pratchett one day. She said, can you show me how? I said, yes, okay, I'll show you how. So fortunately, I, I knew about Terry Pratchett because Ben, who you talked to, used to be a Terry Pratchett manic. And he, all his Terry Pratchett books are upstairs in his bedroom here. And I had read many of them. And I'd read The Carpet People. And so I said, look, let, let's, let's go looking, let's go looking. And we found an example. And I said, do you like this way Terry writes? The room was full of a thousand eyes, green, yellow and white. I may have got the example wrong, but, but something like that. The room was full of a thousand eyes, green, yellow and white. Oh, yes, she said, that's, that's a lovely way. It's a lovely way, lovely way. What's interesting about it, I said, what's interesting? Yeah. Do you notice the adjectives coming after the noun? Now, she knew what adjectives and nouns were because she'd been taught a little bit of grammar in school, you see. Kids are these days. She says, yes, yes. Let's, let's compare the two, which is better. The room was full of a thousand green, yellow and white eyes, or the room was full of a thousand eyes, green, yellow and white, which is the better sentence. Oh, the second one, the way Terry does it. What, what's wrong with the first one? It's a bit boring. It's a bit ordinary. That's right, I said. And this is a rule in English, or a trend anyway. Normally, adjectives go before the noun, don't they? And we had some examples. Mm -hmm. If you put the adjectives after the noun, what happens? They become all atmospheric. They add a, a, a thrill. The room was full of... You write a sentence. Can you write a sentence like that? Okay, says Poppy. And she says, she writes down a sentence. The house, old and ruined, stood on the hillside. Yeah, I said, that's a great sentence. Because if I'd written, if you'd written the old ruined house stood on the hillside, it would be boring, says Poppy. That's right. You're writing like Terry Pratchett now. <laughs> ah, so I am. Because the rule, adjectives normally go before the noun in English. If you put them after the noun in English, they add a special effect. Is so illuminating yeah. and so creative. And now you understand more about not just how Terry Pratchett works, but how literature works generally, how a rule can be broken in order to make an effect. Now that's just one tiny example. But every grammatical structure in the language 
can be introduced in that way. Every use of vocabulary can be introduced in that way. Every use of spelling or punctuation can be introduced in that way. You bend and break the rules in order to achieve an effect. But in order to get to understand that effect, you've got to know what the rules are in the first place. And by knowing, I don't just mean knowing them in your head. I mean knowing how to describe them and identify them. So structural terminology and the like is an important means to an end here. It's not an end in itself. Mm. If it becomes an end in itself, it's a disaster. Mm. People think that grammar is just a matter of knowing the terminology, knowing, oh, that's a preposition, aren't I clever? Uh, no, 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 no. That's a subject and an object followed by, and the verb is in the future tense, aren't I clever? Well, you're intellectually clever, that doesn't help you learn the language really, just knowing the terminology. Knowing why the terminology is there, that it helps you focus on structure in a way that will help you to be, first of all, a good speaker of the language, and then secondly, a creative user of the language. That's how you bring structure and use together, in my view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What is your writing process? So I ask everyone this question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I write. Okay. Now that may not seem as obvious. <laughs> and it seems to be an, you know, it might seem a bit obvious as an answer. No. Uh, if I've got an idea that I want to write up, I sit in front of my screen, and in the old days, you, do you remember when you had a thing called a pen and you wrote on paper and all that? To go on, yeah. Uh, you look at the screen and you think, I don't know how to write this. Then write it. Yeah. You know? Write rubbish. <laughs> get it down. Get, get whatever it is down. Get it down. You, how do I begin my novel? How do I begin to write this poem? How do I begin to write this play? How do I begin to write this textbook? Mm -hmm. Get it down. Get something down. And then go and have a cup of tea or something and then come back. And actually it's not as bad as you thought it was. Mm. And now you can tweak it and change it and twist it. And that's how you begin in my, in my view. And then read it aloud. Always read it aloud. I read everything that I write aloud at some point or another. If it doesn't sound right, then it's not written right. Okay. and that will give you the clue as to how to make your writing accessible. So, you know, these are two very important elements in the process for me. Um, never leave a screen blank, um, and then when you've written something, make sure that it's, it sounds good. Yeah, um, a couple of things here. Um, the, the reading out loud, it's, it's very important for uh, second language learning, I think, you know, to, 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 to read what you've written out loud, or what are you reading to, to read out loud. <laughs> but um, what, what I, um, oh, it's just evaded me. It'll, it'll come back, David. Yeah, this comes, this comes. But while, you, while you're processing, oh, you got it now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let, me distract, let me distract you then by saying, by saying <laughs> in addition to it must sounding good, it also has to look good. Mm. Yeah. In other words, uh, you can have a paragraph that simply is too long uh, yeah. looking at it. It's going to be impenetrable. Whereas if you can break it down into smaller chunks, it's going to be much easier for somebody to read. Sentences can sound quite good, but you know, in conversation, sentences are very difficult to find the ending of. You know, you start saying this happened and then this happened and then this and this and this and this and this. Now, you know, that's fine in speech, mm -hmm. but if you transferred that to writing, it would be impenetrable. So it has to look right as well as sound right. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Andy. <laughs> Have you remembered? <laughs> I wrote it down. <laughs> oh, and you wrote it down. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> you took, excuse me. You mentioned about your, uh, your writing process that you, you just write. Do you, did, have, you, have you got a pen and paper by your bedside? Because I know that when, when I drop off, I have these ideas and think that's such a good idea. I remember that in the morning. And of course, you never... You remember. don't. No. Do, do you yeah. have such a... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Of course. <laughs> uh, have a pen and paper. Oh, these days, 
um, of course, a little iPhone or something where you can just speak it uh, and, and record it that way. I don't do this as much now as I used to do. Um, but, uh, but no, I always, if something occurs to you, get it down. This has an ancient history uh, in Elizabethan times, in Shakespeare's times. People used to have what they called commonplace books, where they would jot down. Anything they were reading, say, that's a good idea, I'll jot that down. And some of these commonplace books have survived. Mm -hmm. And they're full and full of, of interesting stuff. Uh, we would love to have Shakespeare's commonplace book, but we don't. You know, just to see the sort of things he read and the kind of comments that he might have made in the margin. Marginalia, very, very important. Sometimes often dismissed as being, it's a way of, of damaging books. No, it's, it's an illuminating way to see somebody's marginalia is a delight, you know? A, uh, some marginalia for some, from some quite famous authors uh, exist and people are fascinated by them to see the little points that they've underlined or highlighted or the comments in the margin and things like that. So all, all, all these strategies are, are valuable. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a pointer to the thought process as well, isn't it? So you it know, is indeed. Yeah. Insight into, into how they work. Um, yeah. The internet these days, you know, can be an invaluable aid to those thought processes. People sometimes say, um, the, uh, because we no longer use pen and ink to write on paper so much, we lose information about the way literary authors work. Because when you look at their original writing, you see where their crossings out and things like this, and it helps us see their thought processes. Well, that's true. But you can also use the internet in a similar way. Um, in fact, I know a number of authors who do this, and I did it myself once um, in a, in a, a, a lesser-known uh, thing of mine. I used to write poetry once upon a time. And once I thought, do you know, I've got an idea for a poem here. I'm going to write it, but I'm going to do it online and I'm going to keep a record of every change I make as I produce the poem. It's only, it's only about 12 lines at the end. And so I wrote my first line and I thought, oh, no, that's not right, that's right. But instead of just replacing it, I recorded that and then changed it. And so it went on and on and on. That 12 line poem produced 400, um, recordings as it were so now you know i'm not your famous poet imagine your famous poet your famous novelist having done this you'd have a perfect record of the thought processes that <clears throat> led to the end product and i know one or two people who are doing this a little more systematically and that will be an invaluable guide to uh, literary creation eventually yeah um, this, uh, uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, to when I was at Bangor University now, actually, um, because we were, we were talking about authorship um, and ownership of, of the words, if you like, or, or the interpretation of the words. Now, I don't know if, if, if you were there when Dr. Lucy Armit uh, was there, but she, she was one of my tutors. Um, and she said, once, once the author lets go of it, they have no control, which is fine. I agree with that. But I, my argument was that um, if I've written a poem and I understand exactly what it's about and someone else misinterprets it, or, or they, they interpret it in a different way, not necessarily misinterprets it. When, when they say to me, what did you mean by that? And I said, oh, I meant this. And they said, oh, God, I thought it was this. And she said that, um, that my... Uh, my idea, my interpretation of it, or what I meant to get across, is irrelevant. When I, if, if I was to tell that that person, no, no, I, I didn't, you know, for example, butterflies, uh, they they weren't uh, an allegory, uh, um, a metaphor for this. They they were just they just happened to be there, you know. And so, for the, the, the for me, the author has the. Um, the, the right, if, if you like, of interpretation. Um, what are your views on that? Well, we're in pragmatics again, aren't we? <laughs> the intention, this is the intention uh, and the effect. And 
uh, I mean, it's often called, isn't it, intentionalism and things of that kind. And it's a, this is a long-standing uh, debate in literature, so don't expect me to try and solve it. You know, it's been going <laughs> for decades, um, and there isn't an ob there isn't a single answer to the question. Right. It's the you know big difference between structuralism and post-structuralism and modernism and all these terms from literary criticism that, that have come in recent years that I only know a little bit about. But for me. Um, you know, both positions are valid. Mm. Uh, the author has a view about what the, um, the uh, poem, whatever the text means. The reader has a different view. Uh, and actually, you will come across authors who say, no, I hadn't realized it could have that interpretation. That is actually a very valid interpretation. I, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> as it were. Um, you get that kind of reaction as well. The people who make a car uh, and, and say you should never use it for such a circumstance and then somebody uses it for such a circumstance and they say, oh, that's really rather, rather quite good, actually. I wish I'd thought of that. You know, it's the same sort of thing, really. Yes, the author has a kind of privileged position, um, but it's uh, words are, are, are never uh, so um, single-minded or single-roaded, as, as it were, to mean that you were able to think of all the implications of having used a particular word in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I, I, I talk a lot to, because of the literary festivals I, I go to so often, talk a lot to poets and novelists and, and so on. We've often talked about this kind of thing. And most authors I find are extremely humble individuals. Um, most authors will say at some point, I don't quite know what I meant when I wrote that. I thought I knew, but I'm not entirely sure now. And indeed, looking back at it, uh, I wonder sometimes what I meant. I have the same the same thing about my own my own writing. I don't mean my my literary writing. I mean my linguistic writing. I sometimes look at a sentence I wrote, not, sometimes not so long ago, and think, "What did I mean by that? <laughs> it does make sense, but what did I really mean by that?" And I and I puzzle over it. So I think there's a great deal more fluidity in the situation than the characterization you mentioned a few minutes ago suggests. Uh, I still, I sympathize in, in the sense I do think the author has a certain privileged position, but I don't think that the, this means a dismissal of an interpretation oh, no. uh, which would take go in different directions yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's um, great that that, uh, that one set of words can mean so many different things to so many people I think it's fantastic that it's that much. yeah T.S. Mm -hmm. Eliot Sweeney comes to mind I gotta use words when I talk to you oh, <laughs> oh, oh gosh words are uh, All right, here's one for you um, do you ever argue with uh, Americans about their spelling? <laughs> about spelling? Yeah. Um, oh, I never argue with anybody about anything, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, the, in the sense of condemnatory uh, yeah. argument. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're talking here, I suppose, insofar as at the back of your mind is, is contentiousness that uh, does turn up every now and again. We're talking about language change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, take the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English language that I, what I wrote. <laughs> its spelling is encyclopedia, P-E-D, yeah. not P-A-E-D. This is from the oldest press in the world. Mm -hmm. This is a British press using what was now once an American spelling, which is now influencing British spelling. Uh, this is the fluidity of the situation. American spellings have increasingly influenced British spellings over the years, but in different ways. In some subjects, the reaction has been more reluctance than acceptance. So, for instance, that A-E spelling, because it's, it reflects uh, a conservative tradition of older British use is much more likely to be maintained in a field like archaeology mm. in Britain, where AE, as it were, symbolizes almost the past, 
as opposed to, say, uh, paediatrics in medicine, where AE suggests almost a kind of pre-scientific era. And so most paediatrics articles I read these days spell P-E-D rather than P-A-E-D. And somebody who spelt it P-A-E-D, one would begin to think, you know, is the guy really up to date? You know, that kind of feeling is around. So you can't generalize very easily. I don't see these things as being essentially argumentative, though, of course, you could have an argument about right and wrong and so on. But for me, that, that is irrelevant. What we're seeing is a fundamental issue in language illustrated this time by spelling. What is that fundamental issue? It is this, that there are two main forces driving the use of language. One is the need for intelligibility. We have to understand each other. The other is the need for identity. We have to say who we are and where we're from, which community we belong to, which community we do not belong to. Mm. Now, that is the difference between standard English or Arabic or any other language, which promotes intelligibility, allows intelligibility to happen, and non-standard, which expresses identity, or in a word, dialects and accents and things like that. Now, both are equally valid in intellectual terms, but in emotional terms, identity trumps intelligibility every time. So when you look at the headlines about language around the world, when you look at the anxieties, the, the marches in favor of language, uh, the hunger strikes that have gone on for language and things like that, it's always about identity, yeah. never about intelligibility. Nobody has died for intelligibility, for the plain English campaign or anything like that, but people have died to protect their language, to protect their dialect. Uh, they've gone on strike, hunger strike, and died. They've, they've been shot. You know, Mother Tongue Language Day, every 21st of February. Because of the day those Bangladeshi students went, were shot by police so all those years ago for wanting to protect their language against, was it Urdu? I can't remember now exactly, but, but you know, it's, it, identity is such an important driving force. Why is there American spelling in the first place? Because Noah Webster, who introduced it, said we need a new language, a new writing system for a new nation. Mm. And this ha is its validity. We want to get away from the colonial past. We want away from Johnson. Let's get... And he introduced a pile of new spellings, not all of which were accepted, mm. but which were enough to distinguish American English from British English at the orthographic level. So we're talking identity here. We're not talking intelligibility at all. I can understand American spellings just as easily as they can understand British spellings. It's not a big deal. But in terms of appropriateness of, of who you're writing for, which exam board are you writing for, <laughs> and things like that, then it is a big issue. You have to make sure that you are um, using a, a writing style that meets the approval of your readership. Mm. And secondly... Um, that you're going to use a, a, a writing style that is not going to be um, considered you know, wrong uh, by an examining board or something of that sort. And a writing style that is above all consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. this, this is where I think teachers have a big role to play. Um, it's very easy to be inconsistent in your writing style. So in paragraph one, you spell it C-O-L-O-U-R. In paragraph two, you spell it C-O-L-O-R. Well, sorry, you know, that doesn't happen. That shouldn't happen. That's inappropriate yeah. use of language. Um, and the teacher has an important role in ensuring that that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you about actually um, pronunciation with phonemics. Um, because of accents as well. Um, I don't know if there's, if there's a proper answer to this at all, really. But with, you know, if you look at the phonemic chart, um, the, the vowel sounds especially, because, the, you know, the um, consonant sounds are relatively the same, but the vowel sounds, if we look at the, uh, the A for apple, for example, it's, it's the um, sort of squiggly A type um, uh, sound, uh, or, or um, symbol. 
but in um, say, say for example, Amer American, it would be Apple. So there's there's a there's a little bit of a, an issue there with phonemic. Is phonemic still in? You know, the phonemic chart is that still no. important? Well, yeah, yeah. There's always a, a phoneme, phoneme hasn't gone out of use, even though some people have replaced it in theoretical phonology by other ways of analyzing sounds. But the basic phonological system, basic phonemic chart and so on is still there. But remember this, there was never one phone phonemic chart. There's an international phonetic alphabet yeah. which introduces sounds in an absolute way in relation to you know, positions of the tongue and so on. But when you uh, select from the many symbols that are there, the set that you want to reflect the sound system of the dialect that you're studying, then you will make a selection that will vary from place to place and from time to time. Uh, so some people will use an open A symbol because they think that better reflects the sound that is typical of their dialect, their accent. And other people will use, for example, an AE symbol or, some, or a closed A symbol or something like that because they think that better reflects it. Uh, and people change their views. So over the years, um, the the transcription that, for example, Daniel Jones used for British English for received pronunciation decades ago is different in minor respects, but the A symbol is one of them, uh, from that used by, say, Gimson in his introduction to the pronunciation of English, and people that have written on um, pronunciation since, like John Wells and Peter Roach and so on, they will make their judgment about which symbols they think best reflect the phonetic realities, bearing in mind, you see, that the phonetic realities themselves change. So uh, the pronunciation of RP has changed yeah. quite dramatically over the 20th century. In the early years of the 20th century, a word like Lord, L-O-R-D, Lord, would have been pronounced Lard, 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 you know, that sort of thing, Lard, very far back, very open. And so the symbol would have to be different. To reflect that. Mm. In more recent times, um, insofar as recede means recede pronunciation of, of the court and therefore the queen, well you look at the way her pronunciation has changed over the last 50 years or so. 50 years or so ago uh, the recording show she was pronouncing a word like man with a very front uh, vowel, man, 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 man. Today, it's much more open, man, man, man. It's only a little change, but it's an important one. Yeah. Uh, 50 years ago, a word like cup, um, C-U-P, would have been very open, cup, cup, like that. Today, it's much more schwa-like, much more central, much more cup, cup, cup. And so these things are changing. Current change in, in RP at the moment, which I'm sure you must have heard amongst young people, the back close vowel, ooh, as in school and cool. Teenagers use that? No, oh, they say cool, mm. cool, cool. Look at that, my lips are spread. Cool, cool, not cool. Cool, cool, cool. I've gone to school, school, school. They're spreading their lips. So RP is changing all the time. And therefore, the transcription system is bound to change to keep pace with it. So you have to look at the reasons why a particular symbol has been used. And don't assume that just, you know, it's always going to be, be the same. There's a great deal of flexibility in transcription here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've exhausted our questions on language, but um, as a reader, whose who's writing do you enjoy the most? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, you know, I, I, I hate questions about favourites. Um, <laughs> Because I don't, I don't have, it's like asking a doctor, what's your favorite disease? <laughs> uh, in a sense, they're all favorites. I'll tell you one thing, I, I don't like going back to an author very much. Um, I don't reread very much. Hilary, my wife, rereads an awful lot and gets a great deal from a second reading and a third or a fifth reading. I don't. Um, I tend to read once and only occasionally go back. There are exceptions. Uh, Shakespeare is the obvious one. Um, I reread Shakespeare an awful lot. For the simple reason, to go back to the question, Andy, of, of a little while ago, that every time I read Shakespeare, I get something different out of him. 
Um, whatever his intention was in writing such and such a text, uh, I've no idea, but uh, I get a new reading every time. And that's, of course, what keeps Shakespeare in the forefront of, of literary thought. Yeah. Uh, but it's the same for any, for any author. So I suppose if I did start going back, uh, I might get, you know, I would, I'm sure, get more out of the second and third reading. But there is so much out there. I mean, heck, look. <laughs> uh, all these books, um, these are ones I happen to have either read or written. <laughs> uh, but the point, the point is, there are so many books out there and each one, the next one is going to be my fa favourite, actually, no question about that. The next one is going to be the favourite. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't know what that's going to be. Did you enjoy Game of Thrones? Mm, I'm sorry? Did you enjoy Game of Thrones? Didn't watch it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am, I am undoubtedly not cool now in the eyes of many. You know, I don't watch television very much. Um, I, ha I watch films a lot. I, I, cinema is one of my favorite hobbies. Uh, you know, people often ask me, you're a linguist, what's your, what are your hobbies? I say, I've got time to be hobby, ho hobbies, really, like so many academics say. But I do really. Uh, I like anything non-verbal, you see, keep me away from language. So I love music. Um, I love the arts generally. Uh, and I like film um, because of its visual element. I, once upon a time, I wanted to be a, a cinema photographer, a cinematographer um, when I was younger and did indeed do a little bit of it. But um, and recently I've been persuaded by Ben to make films of him, which I've enjoyed very much because I love wielding a camera. Uh, but all of all of that's in, in a sense um, uh, by, by, by the by. Uh, it, when it comes to language, it's whatever the language was like yesterday. It's different today. It will be different tomorrow. And it's this facet of language change that is the compulsive thing. And therefore, I spend most of my reading time actually not on fiction at all. Even though I've written some, you know, like like many people, I've I've written my little novel and I've written my poems and short stories and things like that, you know. Not that they're necessarily published at all. I mean, I don't care about that. You just write them because you enjoy writing them. Um, and uh, I, 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 I simply don't read as much fiction as I think most people would or watch television in that kind of way. Um, I read much more non-fiction and actually spend so much time writing that I don't have much time to read at all <laughs> or watch television at all. <laughs> yeah, I think Maybe I should watch Game of Thrones one day just to see what I've been missing. Well, if, if you do, finish it season seven. Though. Well, I like the books better than the, the <clears throat> show. Yeah. Is it, he likes yeah. it quite a bit, yeah. but I like the books. I read the books first. Yeah. Well, did you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, have to, I have to say that, you know, one reason why I should be doing this is because one of the big topics that I like to explore and I'm currently spending quite a lot of time on is the relationship between language and culture. Um, and so much of everyday speech is influenced by everyday culture. Yeah. Now, you know, how far has Game of Thrones influenced the kind of illusion that people make in everyday conversation which if i was hearing it i would not understand because i do not share that cultural background mm -hmm. you know i think it is important for linguists to keep a very close ear open to what's going on in series like that mm -hmm. uh, and i suppose i haven't <laughs> i should <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, cool. yeah. 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 Um, Go on. <laughs> okay, uh, how is it co-authoring with, uh, with Ben? Oh, that's a joy. Um, we have our rows, like any co-authors would. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's a delight uh, working, working with your spouse, working with your kids, working with your parents. Uh, you know, I wish I had the opportunity um, once upon a time. Um, no, it's, it's a delight, and it's a delight not just because of the kind of bonding that's element that's there, but because it's important. We, t we generally work together on topics like Shakespeare, 
how we wrote together a book on accents. Well, you see, you need a generation gap or shift to cover the subject properly. Uh, my views about accents are governed by my generation, his views by his generation. Um, he can introduce me to a world of accent use that I have no idea about. And conversely, um, as an actor, he has experiences about the use of, act, of accents, in, which I would never know about. In Shakespeare, he would introduce a dimension uh, that I would be unfamiliar with. I can give you just one quick example. Maybe he's already told you a, an example like this. But um, when we were writing Shakespeare's words, the glossary of Shakespeare, of words in Shakespeare that are no longer used or meanings that are no longer used, we would come across a word sometimes and I would say, that doesn't need to be in. Everybody knows what that means. He'd say, no, they don't. And the example that comes to mind now is the word goth. In Titus Andronicus, uh, there are Goths um, who invade Rome, the, the ancient European people. And I said to him, I remember the conversation very clearly. I said to him, everybody knows who the Goths are. And he said, yeah, they're people who wear black eye makeup yeah. and so on and so forth. And I said, oh, yes, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> and, you know, it hadn't dawned on me. Um, and so, of course, we did introduce an explanation of who the Goths were for the younger people who would never have heard of them. Now, there are hundreds of examples like that. And that's the kind of thing that comes when you work with somebody from a different generation. So um, very valuable experience and a very enjoyable one. Yeah, All right, well, I'll, I'll go back and write a few books now. <laughs> <laughs> David, thanks once again for Thank your time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.